welcome back to the show. I have the wonderful Jim Davis. Welcome Thank to you. the show, Jim. I'm back. Thanks for having welcome me. Back. Welcome back. Thank back you, with a new album. Yeah. Um, <laughs> funnily enough. It didn't take long, did it? No, it didn't at all. Uh, we had you on, uh, oh, it was last year, wasn't it? Um, yeah. The Head Wars. And uh, yeah, you, since since then, you've uh, you released the remix uh, edition of Head Wars, mm. uh, which was fantastic. Uh, you also did uh, Shadow Addict as well, uh, with mm. a couple of your friends, which yep. we'll talk about in a bit. And yep. you've got a new album, solo album, uh, called yep. Pray Later, which is out now, everybody. So you can push pause and you can go listen to that. <laughs> um, that's the priority here. Um, yeah, don't listen to us talk bollocks. Just, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, uh, like I said, welcome back to the show. Uh, it's, it's, it's like it's been a, it's been a, over a year and a bit we've the world's gone through a lot um and we're sort of i wouldn't say we're seeing the other side of it to a certain degree i think we're sort of yeah. in the tunnel still um but you know through that since last time i've spoken to you how have you been first and foremost good but like most people just bored mm. as well i mean for me i suppose i'm in quite a lucky position because i sit here in my studio in normal times i'd be sat here in my studio writing and and you know recording and stuff like that so when the whole work from home thing came into I was well I have been for the last 10 years yeah. so that didn't really affect me that much but I suppose it just gave me a bit more focus that I thought well everyone else is working from home and there's everyone's got a lot of time on their hands so it made me want to be a little bit more productive because I felt like I should be more productive you know I was like the same as a lot of people the first couple of months of lockdown I was like this is brilliant I got out Red Dead Redemption 2, started all these games that I'd been wanting to play, but felt like I couldn't justify it because, you know, it's just a waste of time, but a really good waste of time. Yeah. So I just thought, yeah, I spent the first couple of months of lockdown. I just, yeah, just enjoyed it really. And, um, but then I got stuck into doing the Head Wars album and really got on a roll with the music and, um, and so I've, I've really just sort of carried that on. Yeah. Just because it's something to do, really. It's just, you know, it's not something I'm doing with any sort of grand illusions of, you know, I've been doing this whole thing solo, these last couple of solo albums, very low expectations. You know, I know that there's going to be like a, a few hundred people are going to be into it, maybe possibly even less, but that's not what it's about for me. It's more about sort of being able to realise the sort of music I've always wanted to make and, and do it myself, because yeah. in the past, I've never really believed I could do that. And I've always just been a guitar player. Yeah. So it's been like a long sort of learning curve for me since I stopped playing live and stopped playing in bands and concentrated on writing music for, you know, soundtracks and TV and stuff like that. It's really made me a million times better musician than I ever was when I was in a band. So it was just a case of like thinking, well, I should use the time I've got. And it was just, it would have, would have been a waste, I think, just to spend all that time on Red Dead Redemption. I mean, I spent a lot of it, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've been good. I've been, I've been good. I've been pretty busy, really. And sometimes I beat myself up that you know I'm lazy and I don't do very much and I should be writing more. But and then occasionally I'll get to the end of the year like now and I'll look back and go, I've actually done quite a lot because I, I think I write pretty quick. It doesn't take me long when I get my head stuck into. I was talking to someone else about this the other day. In the old days, like when you were doing a band, you'd have, it would be like a year. An album would take up a year, wouldn't it? You'd you'd sort of have a, almost like three or four months at least, maybe more, five, six months to write the album. Then you've got to go and find a producer and that takes loads of time and then get it mixed. And it's like a year long project sometimes. But because technology has moved on so much and I'm pretty quick, I can get stuff done. When I'm on a roll, I can get it done pretty quick. So I feel like I get quite a lot done and I still have a lot of time to, to piss around on Call of Duty and stuff like that. And That's good. You need, you need that break. You do need that break. Yeah. Yeah. Video games are a solid break. I've been engrossing myself in Forza 5 recently. Um, really? On the Xbox. and Because uh, it's part of the Ultimate Game Pass thing. It was right. Well, it's not free. You pay a monthly subscription, but it was part of their launch day games and stuff. So mm. um, I've been using that. And I, I got really into this game called, sorry, I got really into this game called Ghost of Tsushima that was incredible. Oh, yeah, that is, yes. I, I got a little bit too into that. I started, but I brought myself like a load of Japanese swords. I get very involved, Barnaby. If I get into something, <laughs> I'm in it. And um, yeah, I remember 
I, I brought like a samurai headband. I brought like a load of swords. I got loads of samurai like stuff. <laughs> get a bit over. Get a bit over. I for, I for the first month that game came out, I just thought I was a samurai. I just lived it. It was great. Yeah, yeah. it's a game. I, I unfortunately I haven't played. I don't have a PlayStation, so it, it it's kind of it's escaped me for now until I get one. Um, mm. But yeah, no, I've I've heard nothing but good things about that game. So, and I stupidly discovered um assassin's creed and i've never never played assassin's creed and i discovered it during lockdown and then god that that i've spent dread to think how long i've spent playing those games it's amazing that i've got an album out to be honest I, well actually it makes me realize how many more i probably could have done if i hadn't been running around on a horse for like most of it <laughs> running around riding around yeah I was it's all say, good fun it's all good fun i say assassin's creed as well it has um there are certain aspects of it that are or the architecture in it is is accurate so there's a lot of times yes. where i've played that game and i've gone somewhere in the world and yeah. i look at a building and i'm like i've climbed that building <laughs> you know it's great well, this is the weird thing this is the weird thing in the new game the valhalla one yeah uh i ended up because i live in colchester hmm. so when i actually arrived at the gates of colchester i was like oh, this is so cool this is amazing you know and i was sort of riding around going yeah i reckon i know where that is but it got a little bit, I, I got, again, I got too involved in the game and I'd be going, taking my dog for a walk and we'd walk past a church and I'd look at the church and I'd start thinking of ways of climbing up it and I'd shoot <laughs> that, I'd shoot out that window. And I'd probably, and you start forgetting that there's real life out there, but yeah. you know, things are slowly getting back to normal now and um, I'm starting to sort of try and spend a little bit less time doing it. I keep beating myself up and going at your age should you really be spending this amount of time on a PlayStation? But why not? Who cares, really? Yeah, why not? It's, it's, it's the same as anyone sitting in front of a TV show and, and binging that. It's the same as anyone, yeah. you know, as I say, sit, reading a book. You know, it, mm. it, it's like a lot of those games have story. It's not just running around and, you know, stabbing people or shooting people. I mean, sometimes, yes, it is. But, you know, in a lot of these games, there is a storyline. <laughs> I've, always, I've always been into gaming though I mean I'm sat here just I just looked across there and I've got loads of old Amstrad I used to have an Amstrad 64 that was the first computer I had right. and I've still got the cassettes over there I can see them now all those games I used to play when I was I don't know 12, 13, 14 so I've always been massively into gaming Yeah, it was great that was the best thing about being on tour you just have days of like just sitting around on the bus playing games it's brilliant loved it yeah I remember touring there you go <laughs> Breaking out the game console in the back of the bus. Yeah. Good. Um, only rarely, only, only towards the end we had that. Before that, it was all like, well, handheld gaming systems, so Game Boy if you had one or anything like yeah. that, or PSP as it turned out to be as well. So, but yeah, I mean, like, uh, over this uh, sort of like past year, obviously you produced this new album, but you did do something called Shadow Addict, mm. which we'll have a chat about now. Um, yeah. It was with uh, Jason uh, Bold. Um, yeah. And uh, oh god, names escape me. Jamie. Jamie, that was it from yeah, um, Jamie Mathis, Mathis, and um, Tut Tut Nick Tut -tut. Kingsley, who I work with all the time. Yeah. yeah, well, the story behind that was me and Nick write a lot of music together outside of like commercial music, whatever you want to call it. We do it for uh, you know TV and promos and film stuff, and we were working on an album of um, metalcore. It was called, and um, it just was really brutally heavy stuff. And we just both said to each other, wouldn't it be cool just to do a side project of this sort of stuff? So I ended up writing some stuff with Nick. And um, we just thought, well, how are we going to find a singer? And we got Jason involved, obviously, because he was because because Jason had worked with me on the Head Wars album with Nick. We, we sort of really got on really, really well, the three of us. Well, I mean, me and Baldy have always got on. We've known each other for years, but he, he met up with Nick. And we just thought we should do something, do a project together. So... We, again, it was that age-old thing of who's going to sing because I can't sing that style of stuff. My voice is very sort of like more, a bit more punky and very limited. I can't do the music so heavy. I can't really sing over that stuff. So we tried a few people and then Jason just sort of had this epiphany and went, what am I thinking? Um, Jamie, he's, and he's got a hell of a scream on him, that lad. Um, so Jamie, we've done a track called Vibrations and we sent it to Jamie and he came back and the moment we pressed play and heard that opening scream, we just went, yeah, this is going to be great. Right. And it just went from there, really. And the thing is with it, it's, it's a little bit frustrating, but not really, because 
it was never meant to be a band. It's not like a, a, a new thing we're ever going to be able to tour because for one, we didn't want to upset anybody in the bullet camp. You know, when we were doing, when we'd done the shadow addict thing, you know, bullet was a couple of months away from releasing new material. So it wouldn't have looked very good. Uh, so it's a little bit, bit frustrating really, but we didn't want to, we thought it'd be cooler just to release it, put it out there. Um, we created a little Instagram thing. It's on Spotify. And it went down really pe well. You know, people loved it. We got a lot of you know really good response from it. But it's not something we'd ever tour, I don't think, because obviously Jason and, and Jamie have got their bullet thing, and we just didn't want to piss off anybody in the bullet camp because we're we're all friends and stuff. We know each other and didn't want to cause any friction for Jason and Jamie. But yeah, it's a, it's a great great fun project. I love it. With and for a start, it was a good way for me to get my seven string out because I've never used a seven string oh. ever up until that project it's never really been my thing but i got a seven string for that project and then we've written another ep we've done another four tracks and i thought we need to go heavier so i got an eight string <laughs> which was thinking about it it's a waste of money in it really i mean which is you can't really see it, it's just back there but you know you're paying all that money for one extra string really i might as well just i don't even touch the other strings yeah pointless isn't it? Get a heavier string on the, on the <laughs> yeah so that's come out really good. And it's been really good fun for me to delve. I've never done, done anything quite that heavy before, guitar wise. Yeah. And it's been nice doing it from just a guitar point of view, because when I do my own stuff, I produce it all and I mix it all. And it's quite a mission. Yeah. But it was nice having, because you know, Nick Tut Tut produced the Shadow Addict stuff. So it was just nice for me to concentrate and get, get back into doing some guitar stuff again and digging out all my old effects pedals and stuff that I used to use in the past and, I, some of the guitar stuff on that EP, I'm really chuffed with. It come out great. So yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's really no, good it's a hell of an EP. I mean, I I've enjoyed it. Um, I gave it airplay. I gave it club. Yeah, I saw that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, it's it's been a it's been a good reaction to it. Um, I think because obviously the association with Bullet and everything as well, and mm. obviously it's something that's not going to tour. So the studio is what you're going to hear. Um, yeah. On that front, and um, I know Boldy got in. Uh, Jason Bold got involved in um. Did another project with Colin from Hundred Reasons. Yeah, I think that's been ongoing for years. Oh, yeah, long, long I, I had yeah. Colin on the show a few months back uh, to talk yeah. about, it. and yeah, so it's a long-term thing. Um, mm. But no, just like he, obviously Jason Bowles has been quite prevalent in the metal scene. Um, yeah, on that front, obviously you know full time for Bullet, but it's still well, Jason's fun. sort of like me. He's just all he does is write music. If you know, I don't, obviously he's a drummer, but he when he's not drumming he's still writing lots of music for he does a lot of music for um for tv and film like me yeah. and we've got quite a few we've got a new little project on the go at the moment actually we've got an album of stuff that's going to come out next year and it's um i won't say too much about what it is because it's it's pretty different it's not like shadow addict that's for sure okay. it's um quite a different direction but all i'll say is the guitars are very weird the drums are very weird it's okay. quite experimental and it's cool. You know, Jason's really great to work with. We work together really, really quickly. So yeah. that's quite an exciting little thing to have on the go. Well, so, yeah, it's good fun. Um, so let's talk about your new album. Um, yeah. Pray Later, which is out now, everybody. Go listen mm. to it. Um, yeah. So I, you, said, you said to me what was it, a couple of weeks ago now, um, mm. and it's been on solid rotation. If I, had one, if I was on Spotify, I'm sure it would show up on that. Um, <laughs> the end of year thing that's cracking around at the moment. Oh man, um, I don't use that streaming service, unfortunately, so I don't get that end of year fun and shenanigans. Uh, unless it's for my podcast, because that's on there. You um, know what they should do with all this end of year thing? Because everyone's posting, aren't they? Today, like you know, their stats and stuff like that. I think it'd be funny if everyone, instead of posting that, they posted their PRS statement instead. Oh, that would be their great. actual royalty statement, yeah. and then then it might be slightly different. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, totally. I mean, there's yeah, there's a whole thing there with the guy at Spotify, especially. Um, but any of the streaming services, um, I'm in total agreement. Don't pay enough um, mm. when it comes to this. If they're charging for their service as well, um, yeah. But also, you know, you know, the sort of I don't know. I don't know what it's like now with radio and stuff like that. Getting PRS payouts for that. I know it used to be quite lucrative back in the day. Uh, give mm. yourself a radio one play on Radio One. And yeah, uh, yeah. You have a check for a few hundred quid at least, popping yeah, popping yeah. you away. Um, <laughs> but I don't know what that's like today. Um, 
because I've it's been a while since I've looked at any PRS related yeah. things music wise. I gave up looking at my stuff a long time ago. Um, if you want to yeah, get all my stuff is stuff that I do for TV. Yeah, and so you, luckily you, there's an absolute shitload of it, so it's yeah. it's it's good. But you get, you get a lot of traction from that. I mean, obviously, I know it's not sort of mainly associated with you, but you know, I don't want to go into your finances or anything. But is it is it is that quite a quite an area to be in to have that kind of like income? Yeah, it's it's everything for for me. It's when I, when I stopped playing in bands, it's it was something I fed into, and I thought, well. I didn't want to stop writing music, but I'd had enough of playing in bands and the whole touring thing. Mm. And I just fell into this thing where I started doing um, a bit of session guitar for a few DJs. And I, I sort of said to him, what's this for? Where's it going out? And it's like, oh, it's for production music. It's going out on EMI or whatever like that. Yeah. I didn't really know much about it, but I knew they'd done well out of it. And that's how I sort of fell into it. I thought, right, well, this is a, a way of I can stay creative and still keep, keep cranking out the music but actually make some bloody money out of it. And it's one of those businesses where you've got to have a lot of tracks out there. Yeah, I know I've got friends of mine who have done like two or three tracks and then just moaned and gone, oh, I didn't see very much. I'm not doing it. Yeah, it's a waste of time. You need to be cranking it out like serious amounts. I mean, the main company I write for is called Extreme Music, or the biggest, one of the, well, pretty much the biggest out there. Mm. And I've racked up about 700 tracks with them now over the last God knows how long. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of tracks and you you know with figures like that it, it's good but there's no point just writing a few tunes you've got to be on it and it's just something I fell into I, I didn't realize that I could write as many different styles as I could because when I finished playing in bands I was only ever a guitarist I never got involved in the production I didn't care about the production I've worked with some really good producers and some really shit ones but I never really took any notice of what they were doing all i cared about was guitars where the playstation is where we're going to go out tonight i didn't care about the compression thresholds or anything like that yeah. so when i stopped playing in bands and started writing for tv it was a bit of a sharp sort of learning curve because i realized i've got to do it all myself now you know you don't write a track and then get a producer in and get a mixer in and then send it to this company because that's just gonna you're not gonna make any money from that because you would have spent god knows how much so you've got to do it all yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, I listen back now to tracks I've done 10 years ago and it's appalling, but those tracks still make money. Um, but I've got to the point now where, you know, I'll, you get briefs, you get sent briefs for all these different styles and genres. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that made me a, such a better musician than I was 15, 10 years ago. Because you sort of think to yourself, well, can I write this sort of music? I've never tried to. And then you realise you can and... It's been really good. And I think that's why when I did the Head Wars album, it was a little bit all over the place genre-wise because I'm into so many different styles of stuff and I enjoy writing so many different styles of stuff. So that came across. But yeah, it's a really good thing to get into, but you sort of, for it to, to make proper money, you need to be doing it at the top top level and be writing a lot of tunes. So yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I've, I've, I've got a few um, well, associates, friends that do do that. Um, they're mainly based over in the states, and and but they, mm. that was one thing I did notice. They are they they do put out so much music, even if it's yeah. like two minute kind of instrumentals or you know something along those lines. They've got just a an, a, a library of just different yeah. styles, different different tracks, different you know, and they they get picked up for different things. Um, yeah, I mean I've slowed down a lot. There was a period when I was writing seven or eight tracks a week. Yeah. You know continuously for years um and i just i got to the point where you you write so much and you just get to the point where you just think i don't need to be writing this much anymore i can take my foot off the pedal a little bit and that's exactly why i ended up doing these albums myself my own albums again because i sort of went full circle i i got fed up and disillusioned with playing in bands and and fed into writing you know for tv and then after about sort of nine ten years of doing that i started to think God, you know, I can do I can do now what I couldn't do back then. You know, I can actually write all, everything myself and realise all these ideas I've got myself without needing anybody else. So I sort of came full circle again. And the idea of doing these albums was just purely really for myself. It was never like, I was never going to tour it. I won't tour it. Yeah. It was more just about, I, I think I would have been really frustrated with myself if in 
you know, when I retire and I look back and go, you could have done better. So that's what I always keep saying to myself. Could I have done better? Could I have done better? And I listen back to some of the old band stuff that I've done and I think it sounds fucking terrible, some of the production and stuff like that. But back then, I didn't know how to produce. I was just a guitar player. So I kick myself a lot. I think I should have got into that a lot earlier. But at the same time, the way technology's it moved on in the last sort of 10, well, five or 10 years, it really suits how I write music. Yeah. Like my brain is not set up for, I used to go into those big studios with huge desks, loads of outboard gear, loads of um, keyboards and MIDI. And it just fried, I fried my brain. I just thought, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know how this all works. And yeah. so when it all condensed down to being a lot more in the box and a lot more audio based and you know, my studio that I'm sat in here is not big. You know, everything comes out of my computer really. My computer is just packed with software synths and sounds and stuff like that and hardly any outboard gear at all. And that's not a very purist way of doing it, but it completely suits my brain. And as soon as that fell into place, I just went, right, I'm off. And I think that's how I churned out so many tracks so quickly because it's sort of, my brain just went right. Yep, I'm on board now. I get it. We don't, you know, all the outboard, all the all the outboard gear, all the MIDI stuff that done my head in. That's not there anymore. Yeah, yeah, I can do it all from one mother keyboard. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think that helped. Yeah, no, definitely. It's it's one of those things where where technology, especially in the music industry, has evolved so so quickly. Um, you could you mm. could literally do it. Well, it's 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 you can you do it in your phone. Your phone yeah. in your studio now. There's, you, know, you can get a little mm. tiny adapter, you plug the guitar straight into it, microphone, whatever you need to do. It's got drum machines on there. Um, yeah. And compared to back when I was when I was younger and learning um, like studio, I was live recording and, and studio engineering and stuff. It was all tape based. So it was um, yeah. obviously the big desk, like you're saying about um, a lot of like uh, racks of <laughs> EQs, compressors, all that kind of stuff. All the, mm. you know, the reverbs, so everything was on there. It was just room full of flashing lights. Yeah. Yeah, it goes yeah. Up to physical tape, um, and then that had to be edited physically as well with razor blades and cello tape. Yep. Um, and then as as I sort of went through, it was sort of at the dawn of kind of computer recording. Um, it was on an Atari Falcon the first time I learned how to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, kind of way back. Um, <laughs> and it was a green screen monitor and everything, and it was Cubase. Yeah, and yeah. That, and that's sort of I got the basics on that. And now everything. Like like with yours in front of me right now is mm. is pretty much my studio. It's my my MacBook Pro. Yeah. Um. That sat here. It's got everything I need in it. Ableton. It's got my DJ programs in there as well. It's got Tractor, mm. all that kind of stuff. Um. And I use it. I'm going to take it to the club tomorrow night, and I'm going to use yeah. it there. Um. I'm going to bring it home. I'm going to edit this up. I, th I think that, like you said, those studios that look like Starship Enterprise, where you just sat there and everything's flashing and beeping and going, you know, yeah. you know, I. I never really thought, it just used to give me massive anxiety. I just thought I couldn't, I don't see how I could control this to make it sound how I want it to sound. And I never really believed I could do it. You know, I never really believed I could produce. I never really trusted myself to mix. I always thought that's something you do. Because I used to love those days when, that's one of my favourite, oops, one of my favourite things about being in, in bands was that period when you're, you, you head off to record an album. You know, we've, I've done albums in LA and albums in um, New York and you've got three months and you're going, you know, walking into the studio every day and it's great fun. I used to love that. I miss that a lot. I really miss the whole, I miss the creative, that creative side of things. Um, but it was something that I never thought I'd be able to do myself. And I think a lot of musicians are like that. You, we, everyone sort of push, puts themselves down a bit. And I had to really push myself. But I think... Um, that's why I just kept doing these, this next album. The so the, the Prey Later album was, you know, I was happy with the way Headwalls come out, but I still felt like I could, I could get it to another level um, yeah. and I had more ideas. Um, I, I never really get writer's block. I've never really sat in front of a computer and gone, nope, I've got nothing. It doesn't happen. So it's just something I need to do for myself more than anything, yeah. whether a hundred people are listening or, I don't know, 100 million, which yeah. isn't going to happen. We'll see your Spotify and your results, can't we? Um, <laughs> um, um, so, what, with that, with, with with Pray Later, what was the um, sort of the idea behind it? Because uh, the first one, mm. like I say, it was a, it was it, there was a few different topics going on uh, with yeah. the wars. 
Um, and, it, and it kind of felt like you say, like, I mean, the title kind of gave it that, that kind of like all everywhere feeling, um, yeah. you know, an internal head war kind of thing going on. You're just sort of a bit scattered mm. everywhere. This one seemed a bit more focused. Um, mm. I don't know if that's the case when you came to writing it. And there's, there's a few different styles, especially when it comes yeah. to your vocal style as well. Um, cause you do see, you use your voice a lot more on this one. Yeah, someone said that to me the other day. One of my best mates said that. Because, and again, I don't consider myself a singer. I've, it's something I've always shied away from. I never really used to like doing backing vocals in any of the bands I played in. Um, but I suppose it's the, what I never used to enjoy was when I'd done the Victory Pill project and I was doing vocals, I didn't enjoy being the front man. I didn't like being up front. And that's one of the reasons I stopped doing that project because I didn't like the, the focus being on me which sounds ridiculous because it was my my band, you know, but I don't feel, I, I think to be a front man, you've got to be completely fearless and just be up there and, you know, fuck everything. I don't care what you think of me. And I'm not like that. I'm really, that would bother me. I'm quite a self-conscious sort of person. And it got to the point when, you know, when I was doing gigs with the Victory Pill band, it, I'd have like, anxiety attacks is a bit much, but I'd have sleepless nights worrying about the gigs and thinking, I'm going to forget the words. How am I going to, have to, going to be able to play and change pedals at the same time? And it just wasn't for me. I'm just not a natural. I'm lucky enough to play in bands with incredible, the best frontmen, um, And I get to stand there and just do my thing. But so, yeah, when you say about the vocals on this, I think I let myself experiment a little bit more because I knew I wasn't going to do it live. There's not a chance of me doing it live. So that would have changed things. I think I wouldn't have done quite so much vocals on it. But it, it is more focused. It is a little bit more, because, yeah, like you said, the other album was a bit all, all over the place, but not intentionally. I was just excited. I think I was like, well, I'm going to do my own album. I've always wanted to do that. I've never really done it. So, and it was just a case of, well, I could do this style, and I love that style. And for this one, I sort of honed it down into a little bit more of that sort of industrial electro yeah. angle. And just, again, getting different people involved. You know, my voice is nowhere near strong enough to carry 12 tracks. So, you know, I've got people like Abby, my wife, on a couple of tracks because she's just got such an incredible voice. Um, but meeting other people like Jamie, getting Jamie involved, who did, you know, the Shadow Addict stuff. He, he's vocal on a track called The Killing Ways. I love. Came out brilliant. Um, but I sort of learned to trust myself a little bit, try and push myself a little bit on some of these songs and um, actually sing a little bit which feels weird i don't like the i don't like the thing of singing it makes you feel very exposed very naked <laughs> should we say yeah. it's not something i would want to do live put it that way okay yeah no I, it's 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 it, it's i'm assuring you it is very good i i'm enjoying the album and <laughs> Thank it, you. The, the singing like it was it was cuz I, I remember the when i spoke to you last time you said you weren't you're not keen on being the front man like you just said then and 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 the vocals on the first one a bit more shouty a bit more punk and yeah this one you kind of like like on pray later for instance yeah um the the title track i should say um it it sort of it carries and and it kind of gave me vibes of um gary newman uh really? sort of, like, of that, the industrial sort of side the the more recent newman if you will uh not yeah, talking yeah. 80s cars pleasure principle newman mm. um i'm talking like his last like last couple of albums what was it um savage and oh god what was the last one i should know it but i can't it's only just come out um but yeah no it just it really kind of it gave me that vibe and 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 it's sort of like that's my it's sort of one of my favorite styles if you will if that mm. makes sense um it, it's that kind of like it's got that electro pulse to it the industrial feel to it it's still got a kind of an aggressive edge but it just i don't know there's just something about that sound um mm. and and your vocal carries that it's it's great i was just going to applaud you on that because i know you're not <laughs> obviously you've, you've just said you're not very confident in it but keep going <laughs> <laughs> that's nice to hear it's nice to hear. i think with with vocals i think it's one of those things where I feel like I have to be like lyrically it has to be telling a, some sort of story. It has to have a point, yeah. whether it's just me ranting about how shit everything is like on the bar is low or yeah. having a little <laughs> pop at having a little pop at religion and things that annoy me, just things that wind me up. I feel like I have to, uh, there has to be 
little a little story there and because lyrics can be so throwaway and i hate throwaway lyrics because it's not just when i write a track i can hear the melodies very very quickly and then it's a case of right lyrically lyrics are hard you know sometimes it's yeah. it's one of those things i've really um settled down into and i think again some of that has come from some of the music i've written for tv and film requires vocals and i've been doing some stuff on like on the side that people won't hear because you know it's out there not under my name and it's all sorts of pseudonyms and stuff stuff like that so i've been doing more vocals and i quite like writing lyrics when i've got a beam up on it about something you know if yeah, i couldn't write a song about yeah it's friday night let's go out and get pissed you know you know it's got to have a little bit of something to it for me yeah. to i've got but i've got to sort of believe in what i'm saying like you know in pray later that track there you know i've, I've got very religious members of my family you know and it's it's not me having a a pop at them it's more me saying my frustration at that if you want to believe what you believe that's fine but you do your thing i'll do mine and yeah. just don't don't try and push it on me and I, I don't know i think that's so that was a little bit in my body i've had for a long time the bar is low is something that's just me moaning that i've had in my brain for the last year or so and yeah. So yeah, if I'm doing vocals, if I'm doing lyrics, I've got to have a good idea and a good <laughs> something at least. Yeah. No, I mean the bar is like, like I say that is a perfect like uh, moaning track, I suppose, um, <laughs> on there. Um, and it was like, what was the one on the first one? Uh, was it zombies? Zombies was a moaner. Yeah. I was moaning about zombies. With well, the bar is low is more about. I just got. I don't know about you, but. TV just seems to, I don't want to sound like, oh, everything's shit, because it's not. There's some great stuff out there. But I feel like over the last couple of years, stuff has got, maybe just because there's so much out there because of Amazon Prime and Netflix and stuff like that, the quality level has just gone just through the floor. And, and what blows my mind is that so many people think it's fucking great. And, you know, like, for instance, every time the BBC does one of those, like, gritty dramas, oh, like, yeah. Yeah. um the line of fire or um the bodyguard or that other shit one on the submarine whatever it was called you know and it's in it's on the front page of newspapers going oh this is the best thing ever and i'll put off if anyone says that i'll just put off watching it and then occasionally i'll be bored enough to sit there and go okay i'll one episode i'll give it a go and then i'll just sit there and think i just don't get it i can't see how this is and, I, and it's also that sort of thing where everything has to be the best ever it's not you can't just say it's all right it's good it's it's okay it's average you know you read some reviews like um i was doing an interview the other day and i went on went off on a massive rant so i'm not going to do it but the last jedi but i'll be okay. i mean for me that was the end of star wars you know i've been into it since i was a kid yeah. remember sitting in the cinema watching that film go it's over this is shit and <laughs> I don't know, you know, I'm sure people quite like it, but for me, it was awful. And, and then you go home and you read the reviews the next day saying it's the best film ever. And other stuff like um, we were talking before the, you started recording about, you know, how we both got this interest in histor um, historical military history and stuff like that. And um, when 1917 came out, I was quite excited about that. I was thinking there's never really been a really visceral film about world war one in a way that i mean i know saving private ryan has got a lot of cheese in there from spielberg some of the, i mean the opening scenes and stuff like that i mean war has never been i wouldn't know really none of us thank god know what it's like but we can only imagine and i think that's as close as you're going to get to imagining it yeah. that those opening scenes and some of the, the combat scenes in um saving private ryan and i was thinking 1917 okay so we're going to see what it was like and i you know like I said to you before, I'd, I'd, I've been to the Somme, I've been to Passchendaele, I've, I'm a geek. I don't know why I'm a musician. I should probably be a fucking historian. I love it. And, and 1917, and I read all the re reviews of it saying how emotional it was and people cry were crying in the cinema. And I took my dad and my dad was like, oh, you're in for a bit of a rough, this could be a bit of a rough ride, son. You know, strap yourself in. And we both watched it and just went, is it just me or is this shit? I just, I mean, I understand how cool it was having that one camera thing following all the way through, yeah. but the, you know, the acting and the storyline, and I just felt they missed a massive opportunity to really show more about World War One, and and that annoyed me. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I'm going off on a rant again, aren't I? Oh, no, and funny. then all the all the bloody Marvel films and DC films and all that. It just seems like you don't need to think. You don't need to watch. I, I tried, I've tried to watch those films, especially when Scarlett Johansson's in it. I try very hard to watch those films. Like, you know, Black Widow, when that came out. Yeah. I was, you know, my wife was like, oh, Black Widow, we should watch it. And I was thinking, yeah, all right, yeah. I mean, because yeah, I didn't want to tell her that I'm <laughs> deeply in love with Scarlett Johansson. But even that was shit as well. You know, there was no substance to it. And I suppose I just miss having something really good. And there is good stuff out there, but... I don't know. Are we ever going to get a series like The Sopranos again, where you just think every episode ends with you going, this is the best thing. And yeah, a lot so I suppose, of... yeah. No, and with music as well. The bar, <laughs> the bar is low thing was a little bit about music as well, because I don't want to sound like an old git, but I feel like a lot of music is so throwaway. And, you know, when I said to some of my friends, I'm going to do an album, they were like, you mad? No one does an album. Just do a couple of singles put out a single every week or every month that's what people do now and i just thought i don't want to do that i'm not doesn't interest me at all i wanted to write an album like a 12 track album and have a little bit of a story going through it or you know i like the whole process of writing an album and thinking what's going to be the opening track what's going to be the next one how do i bring it down a little bit in the middle bring it up a bit i like you know i love thinking about those sort of things and that's how i used to absorb music when i was a kid you know you'd go to the shop and get i don't know when alice in chains dirt came out and you're like reading from reading the inlay card reading the lyrics just completely immersed in it and i just don't think you don't get that so i thought if i'm going to do these albums and and that's why on pray later hooking up with the armor light guys i got to, to do a cd yeah um which is something i've wanted to do for quite a while even though i haven't, <laughs> I haven't even got a cd player it's hilarious i've got one i've got it sat over there in my vision but i can't play it yeah. Luckily, I know what it sounds like. But Good. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's a funny old thing. It's just I suppose I feel like I'd like to be tested a little bit more watching TV and films yeah. and books and because there was a golden period, wasn't there? But maybe just everything's oversaturated and there's so many streaming things. They've got to keep up the content, yeah. especially with the whole lockdown thing. Yeah. I mean, I but anyway, it's, it. it's 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 there's a lot of there's a lot of need for new content and it's kind of it's like it's like the music industry when there is a popular um genre it suddenly becomes saturated because they're just churning stuff out after a while and i think yeah, it's yeah. the same with like that every sort of like comic book property got purchased after marvel sort of started to really sort of yeah be successful with making movies um but then i i've i've found myself like especially with the star wars i can relate to you on that one it's it's very <laughs> like I got when I watched the last last Jedi and and the one before that, I had this mm. sort of like moment of like, shit, these ones aren't for me anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not about us anymore. It's for like, the kids. And... The, the the original trilogy, fantastic. That set your imagination alight. I mean, I was a kid, yeah, yeah. like very young at the time, but you know, a space movie. And you're like, you know, and that mm. went went on to like. Uh, Nighthawks, uh, Battlestar Galactica on TV, Star Trek, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And it was just like, it just sort of, when you're young, your imagination goes in. And then watching the new, like the other trilogy that George Lucas did, yeah, there were yeah. moments in that, but I didn't really have the sort of like, it, you know, the, I, don't, I guess I didn't realize at the time that it wasn't made for me. It was made for mm. a person my age then, not my age now <laughs> yeah exactly and that's what i think a lot of us of a similar age struggle with that the yeah. fact that they've taken away our stalls but Honestly, the thing is though you got yeah. rogue one which was so good that was, i was gonna say so good and that was like look at what you could have won and i was thinking these next films are gonna be oh mate this is gonna be so good and rogue one was perfect i think they should have just done rogue one and just finished it because I didn't really get, I couldn't really do the Mandalorian. The storyline was fucking ridiculous. And, you know, it was all, the whole thing was, do you, do you watch South Park? Do you yeah. know South Park? Yeah. Do you remember the member berries? Remember? Oh, the little yeah. member yeah. berries. Yeah. It was all about nostalgia. Remember? Yeah. Remember Han Solo? Yeah. Remember Boulder Fett? That's what the Mandalorian was for me. I was watching it going, the storyline is shit. The Yoda thing is purely for people to buy it because it's oh, cute. Yeah. 
Um, but I'm sitting there going, oh, look, do you remember that fella there? Oh, do you remember that fella? Oh, do you remember that bounty hunter? And that's all I was doing in The Mandalorian was, remember? Remember? remember <laughs> and that's what it was. No. But it wasn't for us. And, you know, I've got to move on. But, you know, I sound like a hypocrite as well because all these Marvel films that just do my head in, and then the most successful track off of, there was a track I did on the Head Wars remix album that I got my friends Imperium to remix, a track called Caged. <laughs> and then suddenly one day my phone goes mental, all these people tagging tagging me in the, on Instagram. And I was like, what's going on? And oh, this, your track's used, been used on blah, 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 blah. I was like, what, what's that? And it was a thing called The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, oh, yeah. which is like a, a Marvel thing. Yep. And uh, basically what had happened was the villain, Nemo, who had gone into a club and was sort of doing this dad dance in the club. Yeah. And they'd used my track in the background for him to to dance to, because all the fans thought it was hilarious, him, yeah. him doing his dad dance, and uh, asked Marvel to do an hour-long loop of him dancing. And they used my track for that hour-long loop. Wow. So <laughs> that racked up. That was hilarious. That racked up like millions of plays on Spotify and stuff like that. And eventually people started going, you know, what's his tune? What's his tune? So, you know, there's me going, oh, another superhero film. But yeah. my stuff gets used on it. But Yeah, I mean, why not? Yeah, you know. Who cares? I, don't care. I, was, I remember that happening, actually. I remember, like, and suddenly seeing everything, everyone tagging your stuff in it. That was amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, because before I've had, I've had, like, uh, people who I know have, like, their track used at, like, Call of Duty trailers. Yeah. And stuff like that and it's like oh it's crazy it's like you know it's yeah. not used in the game but it's used for the you know the pre-trailer or whatever on that side of it um or like some of those events where they release the games or you know announce mm. the games and they have the tracks in the background but no that was fine i remember that because i remember the i remember the sort of hour-long like dance thing and everything like that the loop and it was quite funny <laughs> actually that brings up to the question where, where's the strangest place you found your music being played like what like of all in the, the toilet? Really? No, 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 no. I was going to well, say, as in on on TV. Yeah, like the strangest TV show or movie or something complete. Because obviously you put your music out there, and it's mm. licensed to, you know, I guess yeah. multiple companies. Yeah. Um, but and then they can essentially. Do you get a say on where it gets used, or is it just like? Their no, main... no. I mean, I, I sort of write for I write for extreme music, so everything I do goes out through them which is one of the reasons I wanted to do these solo albums because I knew I had an outlet for it anyway and it was going to be worth doing. Yeah. Um, but I don't have a... I have, most of the time, I have no idea where the stuff gets used until very occasionally I'll hear it on TV. Like, for instance, I was watching... Um, I'm really into the F1, yep. the uh, Grand Prix stuff, and I was watching the Drive to Survive, Drive to Survive thing on Netflix because it's so good. Yeah. And loads of my tracks were on that. And I thought that was really cool. There was loads of really cool scenes featuring a couple of the tracks from Head, um, Head Wars and other stuff. And that was cool. Um, I was watching stuff like the Grand Tour and that pops up on that all the time. But to be honest with you, I'm a bit desensitized to it now because when you first start doing this, you get really excited. You go, oh, that's my track, that's my track. But now it, I sort of sit there watching telly and I'll go, I recognize that. What is it? Oh, it's one of mine. But I, it doesn't really excite me like it used to because that's the business you know and yeah. but yeah I'm, I've, I've had tracks on some proper rubbish but who cares i couldn't care less because that's the business you're in yeah, yeah. a lot of the stuff gets used on reality tv okay. uh but it gets gets used on some really cool stuff i got some stuff used on um some of the trailers for rogue one and stuff like that and so for all the good all the shit stuff but i say shit stuff it makes money so who cares yeah. But the the there's there's good stuff as well. But you know, you can't be fussy about that. No, I was just curious to see where like if obviously, you know, where the con if there's any control where it goes, but also nah. if there's any like you've just been randomly watching, I don't know, a, a kid's show or something like that, or something pops mm. up and you just hear one of your instrumentals in the background. I just like yep. or if you're watching like EastEnders or something or Corey, it's just like on the radio in the background. The thing is, is I don't watch I don't watch those programs, sort of programs. A lot of the stuff like, you know, keeping up the Kardashians and all that bollocks. You know, my missus watches a lot of that. So, you know, and occasionally I might watch it. Yeah. You know, it's just easy on the eye, some of it. <laughs> but I, you know, I do hear stuff on there and you sort of go, oh, half of you goes, oh, that's cool. And the other half goes, is it? But again, it's that's a different side to what I do. That's my composer yes. side. Yeah. As compared to artists. 
Yeah, it's a shit Yeah, no, I was just curious, like, because if, you know, if it's that thing, if you had control of where it went, would you have allow it, allowed it to go on some of the things that you've heard it on? Or mm. do, do you see where it, like, on your, like, sort of, like, I get <laughs> payouts or, or, or statements mm. or anything? Does it say um, what show it's used on? Or I'm just, because yeah. I've never had this. So, yeah, 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 like, yeah. you know, 20 seconds on such and such show and stuff like that. Yeah. But I used to in the old days when I first started doing it, I would I'd get my statements through and and sort of go through it meticulously and go, oh, that got used on that. That got. I get to the point now where it comes through, and I just haven't got time. The last statement was seventeen hundred pages, over seventeen hundred pages long. I just I haven't got time to sit and look through it. You know, it's just yeah. so I'll look at what done the best out of interest. Yeah. But you know, it's a it's a real um, some tracks get you you get used but hardly you don't get hardly anything for it yeah. you'll get i've had you know everyone who's been doing it as long as i have has had a lot of good wins but you get a lot of, a lot of tracks can be 50 p's here 10p's 20 p's but then you'll get your your good ones it's very much a lottery you've got to keep someone for when i first started doing it someone said to me it's like you've got to keep feeding the fire you've just got to keep chucking tracks in there if you let it burn out then you know, you're not going to make proper money from it. And, uh, yeah, you just got to keep stoking the fire with more yeah. stuff. No, that's fair enough. I just like, um, what do you get much like the sort of like music streaming services mm. and you've got like the TV show streams like Netflix, Disney, et cetera, mm. Amazon. Do they, <laughs> do they pay, still pay less than the others? Like if you were to get, say, a Netflix play, or is that is that something? Because I don't know how that would work. Like in my experience, it's the Netflix side of things is minimal, okay. really minimal. You'd think, wouldn't you? Because it's on streaming stuff, which means it must get played loads. That it would pay all right, but I don't think it does. I don't think it does at all. Like back in the day, like you're getting like just radio play was enough. Yeah. On that front, but obviously getting TV play, like convert, like you know terrestrial tv i suppose you yeah say. it was like especially like bbc or something like that it was quite i say lucrative i said mm. the money was was you know because it was a i don't know i guess the, the sort of i don't know it's it's an odd one to try and like fathom because i'm like you know with the streaming with the music if you physically sell the cd you make more money theoretically yeah <laughs> than you do from what someone's streaming the album multiple yeah times. Well, and, and you know, there's, there's no money to be made for me personally. I, I, there's no money to be made in sort of the streams of the albums and stuff yeah. like that. You know, funny enough, you know, when I, I've got like a composer Spotify page, just just because my stuff has to go somewhere, it has to go somewhere. So it's under a different name, and I've got tracks up there that have got like hundreds of thousands of plays because they've been found from TV shows and people shazam them and find them and stuff like that. But there's no income really to be made from that, that side of things. Um, you know, and that's the whole point of, you know, when I was doing, started doing these new albums, I went into it very, very knowledgeable about the fact that this is, I'm not good. It's not about selling albums. It's not about, you know, people get really tied up about how many plays you have on Spotify because it looks good. And if I was in a young band starting out, you'd sort of need, the first thing a record label is going to say to you is, what's, what's your Spotify streams like? Yeah. Um, you need to have that. But for me at this stage game, I couldn't care less. It's it's more a case of it's out there if people want to find it. It's a very easy way to listen to music. Yeah. It's a very throw throwaway way to listen to music. But I do it. I've you know I'm I'm subscribed to it. I do it. But um, you know I've got friends who are in bands who have racked up you know a quarter of a million plays on some of their stuff. But you know I know that they couldn't if they played down the pig and thistle on a Friday they'd struggle to sell it out. Yeah. You know it doesn't those sort of plays don't equate to um, a huge following or anything it's, it's just looks good yeah basically so it's just you know spotify is a hard thing unless you're on a record label that's got ins with playlists and stuff like that yeah you know it's it's hard to do it's very hard to get on those things i just like the fact that it's out there yeah. if people on here it's, it's, if you if you want to find it you'll find it and uh yeah. that's all that matters no that's that, that yeah i mean it's, it's a lot more accessible now than it was and it's I always like it, like especially a lot of new artists that kind of that do worry about that side of things. I always say it's an open playing field for them. Mm. So they're releasing like if they're releasing the same day as I don't know, just pick a big one, Taylor Swift, 
yeah. or Adele or whoever, like big artists. You, theoretically, you've got a level playing field with them, mm. in, but they've obviously got the promotional part to get you know get it played everywhere in the playlist. Yeah. But, whereas before, you were fighting for um, shelf space in HMV or mm. um, you know not it not getting put out in time as well or not mm. reaching the shelf on release day and stuff yeah, like yeah. that and you paid for the plinth if you will in 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 the sort of record stores where people could go to the listing post and hear it yeah um, that was cool i enjoyed yeah i just love that yeah i remember um, jesus i remember before fat the land came out <laughs> they, there was a marketing stroke of genius where all the record stores had a little little sign um, that came from excel recordings that said no the prodigy album's not out yet you know and it was out every you know i remember going to my local shop and it said no it's not out yet and that was genius that was really clever and you don't really you don't get that so much anymore i suppose that, and that is a shame and that's why i quite like putting out like physical stuff even if people don't really buy physical cds no, and stuff I mean, like, like that i anymore. love my physical stuff. i love vinyl i've got my my decks they're under this yeah here. um and i got like three or four record boxes right next to me full of full of stuff uh, yeah. varying from dance music to prog rock so <laughs> got my dad's old collection kind of thing and then mixed up nice. with a bunch of uh, classic drum and bass from the late 90s and, but there's, you know, there's massive pluses for Spotify as well you know if you like you said if you're a new band it's very easy to get music out there you don't need record companies you can get it out there yourself yeah but it depends if you want to take it up to the next level. You know, I was thinking about this the other day and um, during lockdown and everyone, everyone was doing these, oh, hi guys. Yeah, I've got a, I'm doing an acoustic Zoom gig tonight, you know, tune in. And it's, oh, fuck off. Um, everyone was doing it, weren't they? Yeah, guys, tune in tonight, going to be doing some acoustic. But the thing is, for some bands, that was the only way they could generate any kind of anything. For, I know I've got friends of mine that are in bands. A lot of my friends are a crew. They've been screwed for the last couple of years now, almost. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And um, I watched one. Um, there was one live stream thing that I watched, and I, I said I never. I said I was never going to do it, but I watched one, and it was when Phil Anselmo done a, a Pantera. He, he redone, redone um, okay. Vulgar Display of Power. Yeah. And I watched it, and I was just thinking, tell me. That this isn't the future of live music because I can just see record companies now going brilliant. This is fucking great. Yeah. So we'll sign a new band and we don't have to give them tour, tour support. We'll just give them a shitty old laptop and go, there you go. Open up zoom, do some gigs. and We don't have to do a thing. You know, you, you're not leaving the country. You just do it on the zoom. You're brilliant. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's, a, that's a worry. So I hope the stream inside does die on its ass. Yeah, it really was something do. that was picking up traction. Um, and I know, I think Live Nation have purchased or have the means to do live stream shows. Yeah. Um, and I know they have been kind of doing, I know Corn did one recently. Um, I don't know if that was Live Nation or not, but they're, they're yeah, it's, it's a weird one. Um, I mean, my, my sort of side of it is, I mean, I work for Total Rock on that side and i help them with their streaming platform so <laughs> like <laughs> having some sort of like live shows and stuff is is but not the one thing i found really weird was when bands were up on like say a stage and there was no crowd there yeah but they were yeah. giving it like there was a crowd there and yeah it, it felt it felt fake i know some bands like when, when you practice you do sort of go through what you're going to do on stage i've been there yeah you know this point we're going to talk to the audience this part we're going to do this bit that we do mm. and you know and you all have your your mood your thing on stage yeah but watching bands sort of being that way but with no one in front of them like i know yeah. it's like you know when you start off as a band you go and play it like you know the dog and thistle like you say in front of no one um mm. <laughs> and you kind of do that anyway but watching it through a live stream where people were watching but no one could interact yeah so it's, I, mean, uh, it's I don't go to many gigs anyway but i did go and see bullet play down in brighton a couple of weeks ago mm. and it was brilliant i loved it loved it i just love the fact that now i'm not going to get into a big covid rant or anything like that but i just sort of feel like we've got to that point now where 
everyone has had, I mean, I've had three, four fucking jabs this year. The majority of people have. And you're thinking, when I say, I say the kids, I don't mean the kids because a lot of them are quite grown up now, but people who want to go and see live music are the ones that are just missed out on so much over the last year and a half or nearly two years. And it was just so good to see a crowd going for it. And this whole stay safe thing destroys me because what is there to feel unsafe about at the moment after you've had all those jabs you know and you know for kids who are very very you know the, the, the risk is so minimal to these people that and you're taking away that that experience that live experience and going sitting here on a laptop watching it saying there you go do that instead yeah. so i just really hope that we can get things back to normal soon i mean yeah i mean getting back to djing and stuff like that like in my club and everything that's that was weird to start with to be perfectly honest hmm. coming out of that um a lot of people a lot of hesitancy um but over the past few months it's been picking up like people are coming out and it's it's feeling yeah. like a regular night if that makes sense so the yeah i just think these yeah and yeah. people yeah. going for it they want a mosh pit in these fucking clubs as well which is fun um but it, you know and and now that we're sort of you know I'm not going to talk about it, but it, you know, it, it's starting to feel like the fear is kicking in again for people. It just needs to be not. some sort of proportion. Things need to be put into proportion. There's, we've lost all sense of proportion. Yeah. When this thing started, it was. I remember the health secretary going, "This is, you know, dangerous to such a small amount of people." You know, we're going to. You know, before the jabs came out, everyone was. Oh, I'm going to wire myself up by getting into all this, but <laughs> yeah, <it's all> right. <laughs> I just feel like we've lost all sense of proportionality. Like this whole thing with Opti fucking crumb or whatever it's called, the new variant thing. Yeah. You know, God, we've had all these jabs. Surely, I mean, the funny thing is, after I went to that bullet gig, I went to a couple of football games as well. Got the flu straight away because I hadn't been around anyone and stuff like that. And I was on my ass for a week. And I was thinking, well, if I do get this Opticron variant or whatever it's called, I bet you my symptoms are going to be so minimal because I've had so many bloody jabs yeah. that I probably won't even notice I've got it. And it's, it's, I just think we've lost all sense of proportion about who is affected by it and how badly affected they are. Yeah. You know, I've got friends of mine, again, I don't want to get into it really, but I've got friends our age who've died of cancer during, during lockdown and, our chances of dying of cancer are one in two. Everyone's got that. That's a that's that's a statistic we should be worrying about. Yeah, really. Yeah. If you want to be hysterical about something, be hysterical about that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but yeah, um, no, I agree. I'd, I'd like I could I could go on for ages, but it's just you know my 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 sort of day job is very public. It's like I'm in I'm in the thick of like especially at the moment with like, yeah. we just had Black Friday and obviously running up to christmas so everyone's out shopping mm. it's in a retail mm. sort of setting but it's yeah. just you know he's trying to scare these people off i think <laughs> yeah, yeah. i mean i'm not in it. when you're surrounded by people yeah the whole anti-vax thing blows my mind and that's just but that's just human nature you know yeah there's still people out there to this day that believe that the earth is flat you're never gonna how how in the year 2020 there's still people out there that believe that when they die they're going to go to heaven and it's going to be beautiful and all their family are going to be waiting at the gates for them and and that's there's millions of people that believe that yeah. so you know the anti-vax thing i don't i can't get my head around that you know i'm very very anti-covid hysteria yeah. but i've had all my jabs i'll have as many jabs as you give me use me as a dartboard don't give a fuck <laughs> if it just gets things back to some sense of proportionality then yeah. whatever yeah, I mean, I've I've kept the the app on my phone. I got pinged today, so I'm like, I'm not surprised. I get I don't have to isolate because I've I've had the three mm. jabs as well. So like the even the, like you put in the little questionnaire, you just go, we be double vaccinated. Yeah, you do this, this, this. Oh, you don't have to do anything. But I was in thing is, on that. thing is, I'm asthmatic. I'm asthmatic. I've always been asthmatic. You know, yeah. quite badly asthmatic. And I never played that card up until they reintroduced masks this time round again. And this time I'm just thinking, I can't do it. I'm not, I'm not doing it. And it's, it's just, again, it would divide opinion, yeah. but um, I've been out and about this week and it's a real 50, 50 amount of people that are doing it and aren't doing it. And yeah. I feel like it's a very, I don't know. I don't want to get too into it really, no, but 
I, I feel like whenever I go out, I have to carry my inhalers with me because yeah. I don't know. Anyway. No, I mean, you, you've got a cause for concern there. So it's not like, you know, it's nothing. I mean, I've got brothers who are asthmatic. I've got a, I've got an issue that puts me in the vulnerable spot as well. So, you know, I, I just, it's just, it's the hysteria. Like you say, it's the hysteria that, yeah. that, that surrounds it that just does not help at all. And it's constantly with, uh, you know, you watch the news and they're constantly going about the new variant. Even then there's like these doctors saying this variant, the symptoms are very mild, but no one's listening to that. <laughs> Everyone's thinking new variant new vaccine you know and it's like you need a new vaccine the other one's been fine working with the others just just see too early to tell there's going to be hundreds of other variants and yeah, that's the way viruses work you know there's always anyway. a flu virus every year so exactly yeah you know, exactly. anyway anyway back enough, music. enough of that in the back to the music exactly exactly um there was something like last time i totally forgot to ask you about it's going yeah. to take you back because we talked about your time in kit shifter uh, and your time with the prodigy and all that kind of stuff but you did um work with there's a, I really love maxim's album hell's kitchen oh yeah yeah, yeah. and and i know you did you worked is it one or two tracks on that as well yeah how how was that because i absolutely love that album carmen queasy is like an amazing track he did with uh skin yeah, yeah. That that's funny you should bring that up yeah i've done um a lot with maxim you know i see him quite regularly lovely guy Lovely, lovely guy. Uh, that was one of the. There was a track called "Scheming" that oh, yeah. I played. I did guitars on, and a couple of others. And it was around the time I was doing stuff on the Fat the Land album, and I was just sort of doing guitars with all of the guys. Really, I done. I was sort of going around to Leroy's place and doing some bits for him, and then going over to to Maxim's place and doing stuff for him. But that was real nice. That was a cool little buzz doing the stuff on that album, that um, Hell's Kitchen album, because in my sort of discography timeline, I suppose, it goes from doing absolutely shit all, <laughs> playing in pubs, to <laughs> Fat Lan, yeah. which is a bit of a head fuck, to be truthful. Yeah. And then, you know, the next thing on from that would have been the Hell's Kitchen stuff. But yeah, not many people, not many people bring it up, so yeah. Yeah, no, it's just because I, I had it written down last time, and I think I just because we were just talking and it just got missed. On the mm. thing, but it's one of my it's what it's up there as one of my favorite albums. Like, um, it, it's 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 just so dark, sort of this dark trip hop mm. kind of thing going on, um, which was very kind of different from what he was doing, obviously with the Prodigy and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and I know he's he's out, he DJs a lot as well now, doesn't he, Maxim? Yeah, sometimes not quite as much. He's very much into his art at the moment. Oh, okay. I know Leroy goes out. He, he can, yeah, he can, he can I was out of him last weekend. We went and saw yeah. him Perian play. That was great. Nice, nice. Yeah, and no, I've, I just, I, I, I mean, I've, I mean, I think I told you last time, Fat of the Land and, and generally Prodigy sort of <laughs> era stuff. That was my, that was my sort of college years. So yeah. <laughs> it was, me too. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> and very much, very much. I remember recording tracks off the radio from Fat of the Land when they exclusively played it on Radio One Breeze Block at like two in the morning. And yeah. stuff like that, just sort of memories of doing that, and and and, and yeah, and obviously pitch shifter and stuff, which we talked about last time, hmm. you know. Um, and they're sort of they've just re released dot com as well, haven't they? On the is it a vinyl? I don't re release, okay. They've done a vinyl re release, oh, <laughs> the dot com album. Good, just to let you know. Um, I missed out on it on the pre orders, so <laughs> um, but yeah, um, they're, they're, I mean, they're still busy doing stuff, they had the gigs lined up for this year, but unfortunately, they've been postponed till next year now. So, um, I still got my ticket, so I'm gonna go see them up in uh, good luck, up in good Nottingham, luck. I think. So, should be good. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like with 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 Hell's Kitchen because it's kind of a I don't know, was it? It's kind of a cult classic, I suppose, just for sort of yeah. word on that side of it because it was very like in the time of that, and and like I said, the likes of Tricky, Massive Attack, mm. um, that sort of era is that very slow, sort of grinding very different from the sort of like fast paced prodigy stuff um at the yeah. time and obviously like you say you worked on scheming mm. so did you work on any other tracks or was it just that one that you, you... No, i did but i can't remember what they are the funny oh. thing is occasionally people pop up on my instagram and go like a lot of crazy russians and go oh did, did, didn't you play on this track for for maxim and <laughs> i actually had to google it myself and i went <laughs> oh yeah i did because actually 
Yeah, played on quite a lot of stuff, but yeah. you tend to forget it sometimes. So no, I was just I was curious because I, I say I love that album and it, I totally missed mm. it last time. So kudos nice. for that. <laughs> so, yeah, Thank you. Yeah, that's nice. I have to give it a blast again. Yeah, yeah I mean, I say Carbon Queezer. I remember seeing that video on uh, on MTV. Um, yeah. Back then, and it was obviously him and Skin from Skunk and Anty, and mm. um, uh, like an amazing track, amazing, like you know, yeah. just sort of, and and it plays well in the club as well. So I do these like alternative nights and stuff like that, and I I drop that one occasionally. And like, who's this? This isn't Skunk and Anty. I said, no, no, no. This is you know, guy from the Probe yeah. and the and the and Skin from Skunk and Anty. Yeah, Ant. like, no, that's good. What is this new? I'm like, no. No, this has been out for almost twenty years. <laughs> so <laughs> just to age myself. Um but uh yeah, it's like when I drop uh I got a vanilla ice um he did a new metal album. Yeah. Oh, I remember. totally on a tangent. Uh in like nineteen ninety nine. He worked with Ross Robinson, so he did a proper new metal album. And uh, he did a he did a version of Ice Ice Baby. Yeah. And I dropped that in the club and they're like, Who's this? Who's this? Like, it's vanilla ice. I'm like, no, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great um but yeah i, I, I guess we'll wind things up now if that's all right mm. I, I, i've kept you for for, for a while it's been, it's been great i love it yeah um, it's all good fun excellent excellent i mean last time we got your sort of like you know top albums and and hobbies and stuff which we kind of brushed on here but um mm. my en- ending question on this one uh is uh well i've got two actually what's your best live show you've ever been to and What's your favourite bit of studio gear? Just sort of give you a heads up. Right. On that one. <laughs> Christ, this is probably where you pause this interview for about 20 oh, minutes while it's right. I it's try and work it out. I think the tricky thing was the live show side of things. Oh, I, actually, I, I know. I yeah. know, I know. I had to think about that because obviously being on tour, you play with so many bands that I ended up playing on tour with so many of my favourite bands and yeah. you get to see them. Like, for instance, Pantera. I was obsessed with, I've always been obsessed with Pantera. Dimebag Daryl was like best guitarist, I think. Yeah. Definitely best metal guitarist ever. Yeah. Um, so I was always obsessed with them. But then you, you go from being, obs- you know, a big fanboy of this band to suddenly being on tour with these people and seeing them every day. And that, that's, you know, I never really, I'm not very cool, Barnaby. I'm not one of these people that can go, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, hi Dimeberg, man. Yeah, you know, it's every day. I'm just, I was on on the Ozfest. I was there going, <laughs> you know, I'm a fan of music. You know, I'm not ever going to try and play it cool because I can't. I can't pull it off. I'm just always going to go. Okay, well, it's Tom Morello. This. <laughs> um, so I was, I was struggling to think, but I think it was going to have to be. I saw Pantera when they were doing Vulgar Display of Power, um, and I think it was at. God, I'm going to have to try and get this right. I'm pretty sure it was a Hammersmith Apollo or Odium, whatever it was called back then. And it was Pantera. And I think Alice in Chains were playing. I think they were supporting. But it's definitely a Pantera gig. So it was either that one or when they played the Astoria for, for Vulgar Display of Power. And I think those gigs were just brutal. Yeah. So heavy. Yeah. And favourite piece of studio gear? Um it's hard to say now, isn't it? Because I'm looking around the studio and there's everything's in my computer. <laughs> so what's, I can't go to plug in then. What's the, like, if, as soon as you're sort of like going to come up and write something, what's your, what do you fire up first? That's just a good question. Yeah. Cause I, I've never, ever start with guitars or anything like that. I never, to be honest with you, when I'm writing stuff, I start with loops, get a good drum loop, get a good bass line, and then build around that. Okay. These days, I, I resent almost having to go like this. <laughs> Pick, yeah. You know, plug it in, tune it up. It goes out of tune every 10 seconds. And pedals, I've got pedals all over the floor here and I can't find the fucking adapters for them all. And <laughs> some of these pedals are knackered from the old days. I've got this pedal. Where is it? Oh. This filter pedal, which I used all the time, and it's knackered, it doesn't work, but the sound it makes is still so incredible. It, it's not supposed to make that sound. Yeah. But I don't know where, you know, so if I want to put some guitars in, it takes me half an hour to find the adapters and all the leads. So I tend to I tend to resent having to play guitar these days. I don't do it that much. Maybe that's why there's not so much. Then again, there is quite a lot on Pray Later. It's just more subtle and more textural. Yeah. Um, so 
synth wise there's one called nexus that i use quite a lot and um, the good thing about that is you can constantly update it with all these add-on packs for different sort of sounds and stuff like that and i think omnisphere there's a massive massive synth i say massive it's just massive because it's got so many preset sounds in there so many sounds and sometimes when i'm writing a track either for my for myself or for um, cinematic stuff or tv or whatever it takes me longer to find the sound than it does to write a track because i'm constantly going through this sound going i love that i love that i love that and you have to at some point go just make a decision and yeah. stay on that sound yeah. so so that's why some of the tracks of my albums have got like 150 160 channels of stuff running because i, I just find so many sounds that i want to get in there and i don't chuck them in there just to get them in there but um omnisphere is one of those simps where there's just so many good things to choose from it's, it makes it hard sometimes to just to, to go right i've learned to do it now but yeah. in the old days i'd be sitting there going I've just spent the last two hours just going through sounds, you know, and I could have written a track by then. So I've learned to hone it a bit more and I've got my go-to sounds and stuff like that. So that's what makes writing my own albums fun now because I've learned what all my favorite stuff is and what sounds good from all the other stuff I've done. Okay. So it makes it a fun process. That's awesome. And what's your sort of, um, your door of choice of the AW? Um, I like the bi-folding ones. Yeah. Yeah, or a patio. I like a slider. Not the swing, the swing doors, like a barn. No, 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 because no, no, they tend to in the wind catch a bit of wind and the yeah. thing off the top. Uh, it's logic audio. Logic. Always been logic audio. Oh. <laughs> I couldn't use anything else. My brother-in-law, who's who writes some, some incredible stuff, he uses um, Cubase, and I go around and sit and look at his screen and just go, no, honestly, I can't imagine writing using Cubase and. Appleton, you know, my mate Leroy, he uses Appleton. Yeah. He's tried to get me off of um, Logic quite a few times. It's just never going to happen. It's just, like I said, my brain is wired in a certain way when it comes to writing music. And the way I've got it, everything set up here just works. Yeah. If I changed anything, it would just slow me down and for a, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I jump between Logic and uh, Ableton myself. So it's, uh, yeah, I certainly, I certainly, Logic is, is, just feels a lot more. I don't know. It feels a lot solid. more powerful, solid. It is these days. Um, so it's it's uh, yeah. No, Logic's a hell of a program. I mean, I came from Cubase. I used I think Reaper for a while, which is like a freeware one. Um, actually, there was one that really confuses me. I don't know why. Like looking at it, have you ever heard of a, a program called Renoise? No. Uh, no. Um, it's like making music with lines of code. If that makes sense. Like it just reads yeah. code and sounds stuff. horrible. Yeah, there's some people that can do it, and there are, I I look at it, I'm like, no, my brain will not, can't take that. <laughs> it's, no, no. I like audio in front of me, so it's like there. <laughs> You're a fiddler, aren't you? You're one of these people that I've got friends that are fiddlers. They'll instead of writing a tune, they'll sit there fiddling with like a hi hat sound or, or, or loads of different sort of <laughs> loads of different <laughs> presets, not presets, loads of different plugins. Be fiddling away for the time it takes me to write a tune. Yeah, no, I've 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 stopped doing that. I used to do that with like the snare drum, the kick drum. Yeah, uh, just sort of home, get my own sound, if you will. But yeah, I found I found like a, you know a couple of kick drum sounds I like, a couple of snares I like. They complement each other, you know, yeah. cymbals, hi hats, stuff like that. And and now I, I you know, it's it's a lot easier than it used to be. <laughs> like a I don't have to do easier. That um but yeah i used to i used to tinker a lot with with the different sounds myself so but yeah you read me right um, <laughs> um but yeah no jim thank you very much man i've enjoyed Pleasure. this um again uh it was great first time it's great second time around so thank you we'll definitely do it again next time you got yeah on or you know maybe in yeah first. give me a couple of months i'll have another one yeah yeah well so. maybe not quite yet but <laughs> You never know. You might get your inkling to play live again. You never know. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that PS5. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, nice one. But thank you very much. And uh, good luck with everything. Hopefully, yeah, I'm going to we'll bump into each other at some point. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm in and around London occasionally. So, that sort of area. Cool. Right. But 
No, and I appreciate your support and liking the album. I, just, oh, I don't take that sort of thing for granted at all. But it's, it's very cool to hear. Thank you. Producing, it's what I like. And shout out to CD and Kira as well, because I knew we were with them for a little bit. So <laughs> we're in yeah, there. Yeah, I'm going to be doing some stuff with them soon, I think. So yeah. that should be good fun. Excellent. Well, um, nice one, Barnaby. Have a good rest of your evening, man. Thank you very much. Thank you, pal. See you again. Bye-bye.